What are the five biggest ethical issues that you'll encounter in all of academia? Stick around and let's talk about it today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up everybody, my name is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh and I want to warmly welcome you to this episode of Navigating Academia, your leading source for guidance on how to advance your career in academia. As always, I appreciate the love, so please do take a moment to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students. Subscribe to our channel and hit that bell so that you get notifications anytime we post new content. You can comment below and also follow us on these social media accounts. So let's jump right in. Today we're going to be discussing the five biggest ethical challenges that you're going to run into across fields in academia. Now everybody thinks that academia is objective, but it's really not. I remember when I was an undergraduate student in my first ever psychology class. Now, I was one of those kids who knew since he was 12 years old that he wanted to be a psychologist. That's just what I always wanted to do. So I remember getting my first textbook by Gazaniga and colleagues and going, kind of opening it in my first class and starting to read. And obviously, as I began to read through it, there were citations everywhere, there were references everywhere to be able to support the claims and the theories that were being offered in this textbook. And as an undergraduate student, I just kind of assumed that everything that was said in that textbook was quote unquote true. But at the end of the day, the higher up we get in academia, the more research that we do, the more that we come to recognize that the concept of truth has a whole lot of statistical error in it. It's one of these things at the end of the day where even though academics do their best, in most cases, to be objective, at the same time, some things can creep in that can really significantly influence the direction of entire fields and represent ethical dilemmas for all of us. So that's the aim of this video. So let's go ahead and jump in and talk about ethical challenge number one. So issue number one are two related concepts referred to as data mining and so-called salami articles. So what is data mining? Well, obviously in scientific research, to be able to conduct a study, you have to collect data. And when you collect data, you of course put it into some kind of a data set. And there's all kinds, I mean, oh really, there are many, many dozens of statistical programs out there that are used for the purposes of data analysis, from SPSS to Stata, which is my personal favorite, to R, to MATLAB, to Bugs. Uh, we literally could be here all day if all we want to do is talk about statistical programs. And if you're interested in learning about my top five statistical analytic packages, let me know in the comments below and I can make a video like that for you guys. Uh, but for the meanwhile, we'll stay focused on data mining. So the idea is that finally I've got my data set and then I have to conduct statistical analysis. Now, in another video, we've talked about this concept of publish versus perish, and I'll link, a, link to that down in the description below. But the idea behind publish versus perish is essentially that academics are under a huge amount of pressure to continuously putting, be putting out new articles over and over again to be able to keep themselves at the top of the field, to be able to help them get promotions, to be able to increase their status as thought leaders. So really, sometimes how this comes out is people saying, I don't have time to be able to conduct new studies or collect new data sets. And so because of that, I'm going to take the data sets that I already have access to. And yes, the big findings have maybe already been published, but I'm going to just continuously mine this data set by doing new analyses over and over again until I find something that is publication worthy. And then I'm going to write up an article on it and submit it to a bunch of journals. Now, this is something that is found really throughout academia, no matter what field you're in, what field of scientific research. Uh, but 
it's not really a good thing. Now, on the one hand, you could have something where you're conducting a very unique set of analyses. For example, my old field was called forensic risk assessment. It's kind of criminal profiling. The idea is that we predict the likelihood of future offending amongst people who are either mentally ill or have a history of offending themselves. So the idea is that if I collect a data set and the data set is all about taking a group of 100 prisoners and scoring them on the same risk assessment checklist and then following them three years into the future to be able to see whether or not they did something bad again, whether they re were reconvicted of a crime, ended up back in prison. Let's say that's the data set. Maybe I already did a study to be able to take a look at what's called the predictive validity, so the accuracy of that checklist in determining whether those offenders would recidivate, in other words, whether they would come back. But let's say that then I want to take a look at other characteristics of that checklist. I can use something like uh, factor analysis to be able to take a look at the underlying constructs of the items on this instrument. That's something that would be worthwhile and would be unique. But if it's something where I'm taking a look at the accuracy of that checklist in all 100 prisoners, and then I say, ah, oh, you know, I really need, I really need some new publications. What am I going to do? Well, maybe I'll just split it up by uh, male offenders and female offenders, and then do the same analyses and then publish that. Or maybe I'll do one by uh, ethnic minorities versus the ethnic majority, and then I'll publish findings on that. Or I'll do it amongst individuals who are older versus individuals who are younger. I'll frame the article like that, and then I'll publish that. These are called salami articles, where basically you're just, you know, taking all the data, looking at it over and over and over again, and then you're, you know, publishing all of these different articles based on them. We call these salamis. So the issue that we have with this, of course, is that arguably any of those sorts of findings, which are not kind of like major findings, it's just the same kinds of analyses being done on, on subsets of your sample, it, all of these analyses should arguably have been included in the initial seminal publication on the data set. Uh, some people, uh, they, I have heard of this being done, it's obviously not a great thing, will intentionally you know, come up with a publication plan where they say we're only going to publish data on the whole data set here, and then they come up with a series of salami articles to be able to do afterwards. That's not cool, it's not a great idea. I do get the publish versus perish thing, but it really is a good idea that if you're going to be publishing multiple studies and you do come up with a publication plan, that you make sure that each one of those publications is going to be very unique and is going to either use a different methodology, so like an analytic strategy, uh, or is going to you know come at things from a different theoretical perspective, uh, but is not going to be basically the same article over and over again, just using the uh, you know, same methodology on subsets. Not cool. So you'll run into this quite a bit and it really does represent an ethical challenge because then you're ending up looking at all of these different publications, trying to make heads or tails of them, and sometimes those different studies are combined within something called a meta-analysis or a systematic review, which is where you take all publications in the field, so you know, a whole bunch of them, and kind of put them together. And obviously, if you have multiple publications that are on the same data set, it can essentially uh, create uh, the illusion that there are you know, multiple studies with the same or very similar findings, when in actuality it's all based on the same data set. So it can kind of provide uh, an inappropriate weighting to a single data set in these reviews. Issue number two is called methodological manipulation. Uh, this is something that you know you would never dream happens in academia, but I can tell you from the inside, it happens all the time. Uh, I have heard of it uh, literally every year for the decade that I have been in academia, and I'm talking across scientific fields from genetics to psychology to sociology uh, to I mean you name it, whatever field of scientific research, you know you will find this. Uh, sometimes it's unintentional. Intentional. Sometimes it is intentional, which is very unfortunate, but you know it is what it is. Um, so methodological manipulation essentially means uh, picking and choosing methodologies based on what gives you the results that you want to find. So let's use as an example prediction. So let's use the example I used a moment ago. I've got 100 prisoners. I'm trying to see whether or not a checklist predicts whether they'll come back or not. 
Okay, so let's say that on that checklist there are 50 different questions and I want to find out which of those 50 questions best predicts whether the pre people are going to come back or not, right? So instead of looking at the whole checklist, I'm taking a look at individual items on it. So there's a lot of methodologies I could use there. Everything from linear and logistic regression, Cox regression, so forms of survival analysis. Um, I could take a look at something called Shade, which is chi-square automatic interaction detection. There's so many different methodologies that I could use to be able to build multivariate models that would give me a sense of whether or not specific items end up predicting or not. Um, had a guy, this was many, many years ago, who was working on a publication, and he ended up uh, doing an analysis where he found that, uh, you know, of all of these items, only, I think it was four of them, uh, this combination of four items, of all these checklist items, ended up predicting uh, whether or not people would recidivate most accurately, and it was like, okay, that sounds great. Uh, however, one of the colleagues of this, uh, you know, colleague of mine came and said, well, you know, four is good, but you know, five is such a nice round number. You should really come up with the fifth one. And it's like, excuse me? Right? Uh, so this colleague of mine came to me and he was, you know, expressing his, you know, anguish over this, that he had even been asked to, to do this, to be able to find a methodology that would, you know, magically add, you know, something, you know, one additional item. Uh, and this, you know, really freaked her out and, you know, she wasn't sure what to do. And so obviously I gave her the guidance of, listen, you need to go with, with good science and not just you know, what a senior scholar is, you know, recommending that you do. Uh, but it just goes to show you that, you know, some people are just going to try to figure out what methodology is going to give you the results that you desire. In this case, it was more for marketability. You know, five to, you know, the senior scholar was such a nice round number. Uh, and so my friend, she essentially was very junior at the time. She wasn't sure what to do because she thought, this is such a senior person, I should really do what he's recommending. Not cool. Right? But you do end up seeing this. Uh, one of the ways that methodological ma manipulation can also happen, if it's not a choice of a specific analytic strategy, has to do with the phenomenon called statistical power. So power essentially is the probability of finding a, an effect, like a statistical effect, if one actually exists. And so you may think, yeah, but Jay, like, if something is statistically significant, that means that an effect exists in reality, right? Not quite. When we do null hypothesis statistical testing, so this is where you get p-values and like alpha equals 0 0.05 and these sorts of things, there's also a property called power which we represent as a beta. Uh, and beta can be manipulated based on how big your sample size is. The larger your sample size is, the higher the power. And what this can mean is that if you've got really large data sets that almost, and I'm talking about, you know, in the millions, I had one data set literally in the millions of participants, it was a total population cohort. And when that happens, when you conduct an analysis, even if the actual real world effect of something, like let's say the difference in height between two different populations, is so infinitesimally small that it doesn't represent a practical effect, a practical difference, statistically speaking, when you conduct that statistical test, you will still find a statistically significant difference. So even though the magnitude of the difference is large, you'll find a statistically significant difference because of the power, which is a proxy for your sample size. So this is another big problem, is that some folks will take advantage of that and say, wow, my power is so high, right? My data set is so big that then they'll end up, you know, manipulating the data set insofar as publishing a ton of salami articles because everything is statistically significant. Of course, this is not great. Now, the opposite may also be true insofar as you may have a very small sample size, so maybe let's say 15 individuals, uh, and then you're running analyses that were not designed for very small samples, something like, let's say a test of differences like Fisher's Z was specifically designed for very small samples. But some folks don't want to find an effect, and so they'll end up conducting subgroup analyses on very tiny groups using the same methodology that they would for really big sample sizes and then saying, okay, see, there's no difference here. There's no difference here because they don't want to find a difference. Let's say that you've got checklist A and checklist B for those prisoners and you want to find that the checklist performed just as well. You know, you could end up conducting a uh, comparison analysis between the efficacy, so the accuracy of these two checklists on a very small sample 
find no statistical difference between them and say, hey, they're just as useful, when in actuality, if you had more statistical power, you may find that one outperforms the other. So again, people do come into it, uh, publications with an agenda sometimes, even though it is advised that obviously you pre-state what your hypotheses are going to be. In practice, that's something that happens way more rarely than you would anticipate. And based on data mining and just continuously analyzing a data set, it's almost like, you know, the egg comes before the chicken, right? And you look at the analyses and then you come up with, you know, what you're thinking of finding, which is deeply unfortunate. And it's really created this new academic environment where people are really into this concept of registration, which is the idea of coming up with the protocol and publishing the protocol before the data is collected and analyzed. Because that keeps everything really transparent. So in my opinion, that's a really positive uh, development within science. Issue number three is the non-disclosure of conflicts of interest. Think about this in the context of pharmaceuticals. Let's say that you end up getting the, you know, the team that developed Xanax uh, and then they're testing whether or not Xanax has the desired clinic clinical effect versus not. Either intentionally or unintentionally, usually what happens is that they end up getting more positive significant effects in their research. And it's not just the team, it could also be, you know, a company funded the development of Xanax, and then the same company funds an independent trial. So just the funding alone can end up having you know, a significant allegiance effect, as they call it. Some people, when it comes to the development of something like a checklist, like the ones I mentioned in forensic psychology, we call this an authorship effect. You develop the checklist, then you test the efficacy of the checklist. And this obviously represents a conflict of interest. Now, conflicts of interest are really difficult to kind of do away with, but Pretty obviously, something that you need to be doing is just routinely disclosing whether you have a funding conflict of interest or a development conflict of interest. Uh, and you would be shocked how rarely people disclose conflicts of interest, even when guidelines for publications in their field specifically state that they have to do it. To give you one example of this, in my old field of forensic psychology, uh, there was a big kind of hubba uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, talking about how developers of these checklists, they were testing their own tools and finding more positive significant effects. Uh, and of course the developers threw their arms up in the air and said, no, no, this isn't true, da da da, da. Uh, We ended up running a large scale meta-analysis on it and finding that it was true that the authors were finding more positive significant effects. In that field, we ended up finding though that it was really a proxy for study quality because the developers of the tool were making sure in their study design Designs, that the tools were being used how they were designed to be used. So for the right population, for predicting the right outcome, at the right length of follow-up after release from prison, etc. So it was actually a sign of fidelity and not something where the authors themselves were, you know, like conspiring to get positive effects. That wasn't the case. Uh, now I can only speak for my field. I can't speak for other fields like pharmaceuticals, uh, so on, engineering, so on and so forth. Uh, but we didn't find that to be the case for us. That said, it doesn't mean that you should not be disclosing conflicts of interest. In that field, we have you know guidance for how you should be publishing. It's something called the RAGE checklist. So it's the risk assessment guidelines for the evaluation of efficacy. And people are supposed to be using this checklist to be able to determine what they should be putting into their articles. And one of the key things is disclosure of conflicts of interest. And fascinating to me still is the fact that co-authors on the development of those guidelines who specifically voted for the routine disclosure of conflicts of interest still to this day do not disclose their conflicts of interest which you know drives me nuts uh, but it you know it happens all of the time this is so important because you know science uh, is based on you know calibration or validation studies and then in uh, independent cross validation and so because of that you need independent teams who had nothing to do with the development of a drug or a checklist or whatever it is testing the efficacy of that drug checklist etc so, you know, this is something that it just seems kind of like common sense, but, you know, apparently it's not. Uh, and that obviously raises red flags about why are people not doing this. It's, it's a really strange thing. So this is an ethical issue that you'll find in academia. 
Issue number four is a largely bureaucratic one, but it does frustrate a lot of people within academia, is something called authorship manipulation. So authorship manipulation uh, essentially refers to the phenomenon whereby, let's say that you have five authors of a study, that in some cases, uh, it's not so much nepotism, but it's basically that you'll have authors on there who shouldn't be on there. They didn't contribute to the collection of the data set. If there's no data set, let's say you're doing something in like English Lit, Art History, etc. You know, they didn't write, they didn't copy edit, they didn't contribute to the thinking behind a given article, but you know, one of the authors kind of owes another author, and so because of that, they'll put them on the publication as what's called a minor author. So uh, I'll do another uh, video, and I'll link it in the description below, which is all about authorship order and what it means. But essentially what happens is that you'll have the first author is like, really the author, right? They're the ones, this is their baby, they're taking responsibility for the findings. And then usually you have somebody called a senior author, or usually that's the final author. You know, a lot of people, they think to themselves, you know, a final author, that doesn't really mean anything. But in actuality, it, it can mean a lot in scientific research. That usually is the person who uh, was either the supervisor of the first author or is, you know, a really senior scholar who helped to conceptualize the article and work on it with the first author etc. The second author usually is somebody who I refer to as the gopher, which means they did an absurd amount of work on the publication, but still they're not the first author because it wasn't their baby. And then you get the minor authors after that. Now sometimes the minor authors did a huge amount of work. I know from experience I have publications with people where the minor authors were of tremendous importance. But it's also possible, and I've been on unfortunately several publications, luckily very few though, uh, where the first author on on you know publications where uh, you know I was you know involved with specific aspects, but I was not first or senior author. You know, all of a sudden on the final publication, there'll be somebody's name that I'm like, this person barely had anything to do with this project, and they'll say, oh yeah, but you know I, I sent it to them, and you know they gave their approval at the very end, and you know we're we're working on a whole bunch of projects together, so you know they're just on the paper. What? That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. You do, though, in academia have cliques, and we'll be talking about this in a moment, cliques of people who basically are always working together, and so they'll just put each other on one another's publications. And again, this is something where in academia, when I got into it, you know, obviously, the cold reality of the field and of the job and of knowledge generation, you know, I, it, I didn't have it. You know, I was up here in terms of my ideals and this kind of stuff, uh, and it's really rocked my world being in academia and seeing how things actually operate. It's unfortunate. Um, but this is something that, you know, you end up seeing is either putting people on publications where they shouldn't be on them in the first place or manipulating the order. I remember being, uh, just getting out of graduate school and going to a conference, uh, and there was a, a dinner with a whole bunch of people that I really respected in the field. Uh, and there's a guy who's sitting at the, uh, at the dinner table with me, this is in Germany, and he ends up telling me that, uh, you know, we end up having this lively debate. This sounds like a crazy debate to be having, but if you have a graduate student, who like does all the work on a publication, should they be the first author on the publication? That sounds crazy to me. But the one gentleman, right, who was my first time meeting him, uh, he said no, There's no, he's the only one who said this, thankfully, right? But he said no, he says, you know, if, if I came up with a study idea for my graduate student and told him what to do, he does all the work and he writes the entire paper and, you know, finishes everything and decides on the journal and, you know, submits in these things, I'm, I should still be the first author because, you know, the general idea for it was mine, but more importantly, I'm the supervisor, so I should be the first author on the paper. That's crazy to me, to be honest with you. One of the functions of being a supervisor is to try to make your graduate students better than yourself. And as I've said before on this channel, and I'll say it again, very unfortunately in academia and in life in general, people want you to be as good as they are, but never better. And that to me is really unfortunate. It's one of the reasons why I developed this channel for you guys is hopefully so that you end up being way better in academia than I am. But it's unfortunate. So that's issue number four. 
And finally, issue number five is something that a lot of people never think about in academia, but it is a huge problem. Uh, and these are social clicks that turn into what I refer to as journal clicks. The idea here is that you have a small group of individuals, usually they all went to similar graduate schools, and within individual fields, there's usually a, a core set of universities where most of the big name people are, and of course they have graduate students. Those grad students, you know, over the decades go to their own universities, have their own students, etc. And it creates a very deep collegiality, you know, uh, between these students. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's wonderful, right? I have colleagues from, you know, my graduate school experiences who will be my friends for life. Uh, but here's the issue, is that essentially all of them are so chummy and all that when it comes to recommending peer reviewers, they're called preferred reviewers. When you're submitting an article, you can select people that you recommend to peer review your article. These guys all put one another. And so then every, it becomes this closed circuit. And because these guys themselves end up becoming bigger name people, they, of course, you know, journals will say, oh yes, that's a great preferred reviewer because that's a leader in the field. So they will give preference to allowing those people peer review. This is even more so the case when those individuals who are within this social clique, they end up being on the editorial boards of multiple big name journals in your field, which happens all the time. Sometimes they even become the associate editors or even the full editors of journals. So I've certainly found this to be the case such that you'll have individuals where, you know, if they submit a given you know, article, whatever it is, to a very specific journal, it's like 100% that it's going to be published. And so at the end of the day, these individuals, it's a spinning wheel, right? This circular thing where these guys end up getting published over and over and over again in the exact same journals. And you, you kind of wonder to yourself, it's cognitive dissonance. Well, they wouldn't be getting published unless they're a really big deal. So students end up really looking up to these folks because they're getting published all the time. And they don't take into consideration this underlying phenomenon of social and journal clicks, which is something in academia, again, that people don't think about, but it happens across fields. I've seen it, again, I've seen it in medicine, I've seen it in engineering, I've seen so many places that supposedly are very, very objective in terms of science, uh, and it's a phenomenon that I find pretty fascinating. All right, y'all, thank you so much for watching. As always, it's good to have you here with us. I wanna hear from you in the comments below. What ethical issues have you seen in academia? And have you come up against any that you've had to deal with? If so, how'd you deal with it? As always, please let me know in the comments below. Is there a specific topic you want me to tackle in a future episode of Navigating Academia? Please do take a moment to be able to like and share this video with your friends, with your colleagues, with your students. Subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one career mentoring and coaching, please do send a consultation call with me via the website below. Maybe you're dealing with one of these issues right now. You're trying to figure out how to navigate it successfully. Let's come up with an action plan that's going to make sure that your personal academic brand doesn't end up getting damaged in a way that is still going to give you a positive result. So get in touch with me and let's chat about it. Signing off everybody, have a great day and remember to get out there, take chances and be your best self. Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.